Welcome to the Armenian American Health Professionals Town Hall. Uh, we started this in early March when there was talk of COVID. Uh, one or two people had COVID in Washington State. Uh, there were some deaths that were projected. And here we are uh, very deep into the pandemic with light at the end of the tunnel, but very much still in a challenging place. Uh, we're very blessed this evening uh, to have two uh, of our speakers returning. Uh, for a cameo appearance. They really are all stars, uh, Bishop Daniel Vendikian, uh, as well as uh, Mr. Mark Mobsession, uh, a law professor at Fordham St. John's University. Bishop Daniel Vendikian uh, really uh, needs no introduction. He's well known to all of us for his compassion, his leadership, uh, his uh, astute uh, uh, awareness of this whole COVID situation and impressive uh, degree with which he went about in a scientific way uh, to learn the science and steer uh, the church through it. Um, he has a long pedigree of uh, scholarly publications in peer-reviewed journals uh, and of leadership positions, uh, and also uh, as a camper at Camp Newbar. Uh, so it really is a privilege to introduce uh, Bishop uh, Daniel. Thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, my great pleasure. Uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Njarian, for once again inviting me. It's been, <clears throat> um, uh, it was way back in the beginning, I think, the first time that you asked me to, to uh, appear and to uh, speak to uh, at your town hall meeting. I've been saying all along, uh, since we realized that this uh, COVID uh, pandemic was, was really going to be um, an unprecedented threat uh, to our lives, um, not just within the church, but in general. I've been saying that, you know, the church's mission has to continue. We don't, the church doesn't stop uh, just because of a pandemic, not to minimize that by any means. Uh, the church didn't stop during, uh, during the war in Artsakh. It didn't stop during the genocide. And uh, we have no, I'm a historian by, by, by one of my areas of training and, uh, you know, best I can tell, we don't know of a time when the church just sort of shut down for a while to get through a war. Um, the mission of the church continues. Uh, the means of that, of that, of, of, of accomplishing that mission uh, certainly have to change. And that's been uh, really the, our guiding principle throughout these last nine to 10 months. Uh, when all of this uh, appeared on our doorstep, um, we realized quickly that uh, we at the diocese in New York uh, we're going to have to provide guidance. Our clergy were looking for it. Our people were looking for it. There was a lot of question out there. We had to deal with, uh, I personally, you know, never having dreamed of having to do this as a bishop of the church, uh, the concept of closing our churches. <laughs> so I, who have for, for, you know, the better part of three decades, have spent my life and my life's work and convictions uh, trying to open up the church and make the church and its message um, uh, something that would attract people and encourage people to become a part of our church uh, liturgically in the, in the services and sacraments, but, but in a more broader way, uh, we, my, my brother, brother clergy and I, our lay leadership, we're faced now with the situation of having to consider closing churches, begging people not to go to church. Um, last Easter, you know, we faced this uh, uh, most dramatically. Uh, it is, we, we Armenians, especially, you know, Armenians from Armenia, uh, but many Armenians, you know, regardless of where they come from, where it's wired within us that on Easter Sunday, you go to church. You may not go to church the rest of the year, but on Easter Sunday, you go to church, you light a candle, you receive Holy Communion. Now, how to tell, how to tell our people, please do not do that. Um, you'll, you'll, you may or may not recall that during Easter, we were entirely closed. Uh, recent months, we've 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 opened up a bit and allowed people to come in very limited numbers, depending upon local local regulations. But at Easter, the churches were closed. Uh, the clergy were were admitted to the church. They were conducting the services with maybe two deacons, maybe one or two people singing, and that's it. Uh, so we talked about how to celebrate the Badarak, the, the divine liturgy, the Eucharist. Um, uh, under these strange circumstances, and we found a way to do that. And uh, 
uh, as strange it, as it was, I, I've come to meet with our clergy as a whole, about 60, 65 priests, uh, thanks once again to Zoom, uh, on a regular basis. And we really hashed out a lot of this. Uh, so it was the Badarak, it was other sacraments of the church, baptism, uh, marriage, funerals were uh, perhaps the most heartbreaking challenge that, that I faced as a clergyman, and I know our clergy as well, uh, early on. Uh, not allowing people into the church at all for funerals, limiting the funeral ceremony to just what we could do in the cemetery. Uh, and even there, um, you know, incomprehensibly, you know, having to maintain social distancing from, um, for example, in the case that I had to deal with that was particularly heartbreaking and stings me to this day, a woman who lost her only child last year to a, a bizarre kind of a cancer, 23, 24 years old, and almost to the day one year later lost her husband uh, to, to COVID. Um, her husband, who was a medical doctor, by the way, known to a lot of you. Um, and to see this woman in a corner of the cemetery by herself weeping and mourning was more than I could take um, and more than many people can take. Um, so how to deal with those kinds of things. One of the other difficult things that we faced as clergy in the Armenian church is weddings. Um, you know, the mission of the church continues. For goodness sakes, weddings continue. Uh, young people don't say, well, well, we're not going to get married for the foreseeable future. Uh, we're, we're going to postpone having families for the foreseeable future. Life doesn't work like that. Humanity doesn't work like that. Um, and that's not how the Christian life, in any case, is designed to work or fitted to work. We did come up with a way to do a very limited sacrament, you know, the, the full sacrament of, of marriage, matrimony, or crowning, as we call it, basagatrutun. Uh, we found a way to do that in a safe way with, with social distancing, uh, with certain limitations to the service, but really rather modest changes to the service. But, you know, adaptations which which did sort of take away from the, the beauty of that moment, at least in the way that that young people uh, live and long for that moment in their lives. Um, some young couples said, you know, we don't want to do that. We, 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 we had in mind a big wedding with 400 people and folks flying in from all over the country and maybe the world. So the options, the only option we had was, well, you know, we can do two things. You know, number one, we can do the sacrament so that you will be sacramentally married but it'll be limited in number only to your very closest you know, friends and family. Uh, everyone except the bride and groom will have to wear a mask. Everyone except the bride and groom will have to maintain social distance and so on. Um, that was uh, acceptable to some couples to their, you know, to their, uh, I congratulate them for that, um, but really unpalatable to, to a number of young people. And so their choice was to uh, postpone the wedding uh, a year and hope for the best, hope that in a year they could do this. That worked uh, fine for a number of younger couples. We had cases of uh, folks that were getting married later in life, um, maybe at a time where they really needed to be thinking about beginning a family rather quickly due to sort of human restrictions. And that solution didn't work for them. Uh, to this, as we look ahead, is there is some concern uh, about, about you know, in, in, in when we can say that this is behind us, um, uh, this, this, this pandemic, how will we bring people back to church? Um, we we and, and, and virtually every diocese of the Army and Church globally was able to switch very quickly to a virtual mode, which none of us anticipated, obviously. We did it, and, and we did it uh, well, I think. Uh, there were fruits. Uh, of that endeavor, which none of us expected. Uh, we were able to reach out to people that formerly had had no real uh, contact with the Armenian church, either because they live far, far, far away from an Armenian church community or other reasons. People had moved on from the Armenian church, uh, fallen away from the church and found their way back. And we know for a fact that we've, we've, got, we, we've established contact with a lot of these folks again. We've been able to deliver educational and spiritual opportunities for them via uh, internet, Zoom and other, and other platforms uh, that have really brought life to a huge 
uh, population that we really had no contact with previously. Talking with one of our priests in the diocese this past week, who said that someone contacted him recently and just thanked him tearfully and said, you gave me back my life. You know, you gave me back my life because of the resources, the programs, the prayers, uh, the Bible studies that you offered online. Um, so that's not to be underestimated. And we consider that one of the hidden blessings, if we can even say that, for this, this otherwise horrific uh, chapter that we've lived through. Uh, Professor Movsessian graduated summa cum laude from Harvard College and magna cum laude from Harvard Law School. Uh, in law school, he was the editor of the prestigious Harvard Law Review, uh, which is really a terrific honor. Uh, he's the recipient of the Sears Prize awarded to two of the highest ranking students in the second year class. Uh, he clerked for Supreme Court Justice uh, Souter, David Souter, uh, and uh, served as the attorney advisor for the Office of Legal Counsel in the United States Department of Justice. Um, before that, he was the Max uh, Shermitz Distinguished Professor of Law at Hofstra University. Uh, currently, he's a professor, the Frederick A. Whitney Professor of Contract Law and the co-director for the Center of Law and Religion. Um, there have been so much discussion about um, COVID uh, being an opportunity to restrict religious uh, freedom and sentiments in the United States. Uh, and there have been lawsuits which have now found their way to the Supreme Court. Um, interestingly, uh, uh, Mark, uh, we tend to think of uh, religious persecution against Christians, uh, but we had another Supreme Court judgment uh, regarding the uh, expression of religion by Muslims uh, recently. So uh, we look forward to your comments and your review of all of the events taking place on the Supreme Court level affecting all of us. Thank you so much for joining us. Of what's been going on at the US Supreme Court with regard to challenges to restrictions that the government has placed on religious gatherings during the COVID epidemic. There's been a lot of activity this year actually at the court. There were a couple of decisions this past summer. There's been a flurry of decisions over the last couple of weeks, including one uh, locally here, I'm speaking in New York, locally meaning um, here in New York City, Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn versus Cuomo. There are a couple of more cases in the pipeline, one from California, one from Nevada. In fact, just as I was getting ready for tonight, I, I took a look at the news. There was just a case tonight. Uh, I mean, tonight, uh, as in December 17th, just now, a few hours ago, uh, involving a church, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a, a claim about religious schooling in Kentucky. So there are a number of cases. It doesn't make sense, I think, to go through them all because they're very fact specific. But what I'd like to do is talk about the Brooklyn case uh, and then say a little bit more generally about what these cases suggest about church and state relations in, uh, in the United States at the moment. So let's talk first about the Brooklyn case. Uh, the case concerns claims by the Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn and also an Orthodox Jewish institution here in New York, Agudat Israel, that COVID restrictions on occupancy imposed by Governor Cuomo violate the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. This is the clause that says that the state cannot prohibit the uh, exercise of the free exercise of religion. And this case was before the court on an emergency application for a preliminary injunction, which means the case is still going on in the lower courts, but in an unusual uh, matter, the plaintiffs appealed to the Supreme Court and asked for a stay of the restrictions while the challenge was pending. In other words, they were challenging uh, the, the restrictions on church attendance, and while that case was going on, they asked the Supreme Court to block the enforcement of the order for the pending, pendency of the litigation, which is unusual. It happens, but it's unusual. And in a 5-4 decision by the court, the court agreed that at least at this stage in the proceedings, this, these New York restrictions could not be enforced while the litigation proceeded, which as I say is kind of an unusual thing. Why? Because the court said that ultimately these claimants, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn and this Jewish organization, these claimants were likely to prevail. So it's a signal being sent that actually these plaintiffs are going to win their cases ultimately. That's why the court said, for now, 
uh, the state cannot enforce these restrictions. Okay, why? A couple of reasons. One is that Governor Cuomo made some, I guess you'd say disparaging remarks about religious organizations in New York, especially Orthodox Jewish groups. And the court said that, you know, this was sort of uncalled for, this was not neutral on the part of, of the government. You can't do that. The government has to be neutral with respect to religious groups. You can't make snide or sarcastic comments about, about one of them. But that wasn't the real reason because the court spoke very quickly about that. Really, the court said the New York rules were not neutral uh, with respect to religion because they singled out religious organizations for especially poor treatment. Okay, how? Well, now some of you may know in New York, we have these restrictions based on color. There are red zones and orange zones and yellow zones. So in the red zone, uh, the rules make a distinction between essential and non-essential businesses. Non-essential businesses are limited to 10 occupants and that includes churches. While essential businesses can admit as many people as they like. And essential businesses include things like, well, grocery stores, uh, dry cleaners, garages, things like that, but also maybe some more questionable things like campgrounds or uh, acupuncture, uh, acupuncture studios, okay? So that was one distinction. Religious organizations um, had a 10-person limit along with other quote-unquote non-essential businesses while essential businesses could let in everybody. In the orange zone, religious institutions were limited to 25 people, while other businesses, even non-essential businesses, had discretion and could let in more than 25 people if they wanted to. So that was another distinction. For example, within orange zones, restaurants are non-essential, but restaurants had some discretion about how many people to let in. Houses of worship, including churches, had no such discretion. There was a, a hard 25-person limit. So the court looked at these restrictions and said, this is not neutral. These restrictions are not neutral with respect to religious institutions. Therefore, the law is that if, if a restriction is not neutral with respect to religion, the restriction can still stand. The state can still do it, but the state has to pass the so-called compelling interest test. Lawyers also call this strict scrutiny. And the idea is, that the state can impose a non-neutral restriction if the state has a compelling reason for doing it and the state has chosen the least restrictive means. That is the means that is the less, least restrictive of religious worship. Okay, well, how'd that play out here? Court said for sure, stopping COVID is a compelling interest. So that wasn't the problem. The problem the court said was New York did not choose the least restrictive way to advance that compelling interest. For example, um, some of these churches, some of the Catholic churches here in Queens where I live in Brooklyn, which we're part of the Brooklyn diocese, um, some of these churches can seat as many as 500 people. Um, a few of them can seat as many as a thousand people. So it doesn't make sense to say you can only admit 25. What the state could have done is said, okay, you have to have social distancing, you have to have certain regulations and so on, but there's not a hard limit. That is not the least restrictive way of achieving the state's admittedly compelling interest in stopping COVID. And so the court said, you know, normally we defer to public health experts. There is an old case called Jacobson from 100 years ago in which the court says, when it comes to public health restrictions, judges should not second guess things. Um, and you know, we are not experts in this area, but, but you know, there's a limit, there's a limit. And you know, New York can't say a 25 person limit when the church can seat a thousand people. There are ways to get around this, especially because the court said, um, there's been a very small incidence of COVID transmission in religious institutions, at least in New York. And all these institutions had been abiding by the safety measures that the government had set. So you put all this together, the court said, it's unlikely the state's gonna be able to do this under the constitution. Therefore, the court stayed enforcement of those restrictions while the case goes forward. And the case is currently going forward in the lower courts here in New York. Okay, that was the opinion of the court. That was five judges, five justices voted for that. There were some interesting solo opinions. Um, one justice, Justice Gorsuch, wrote a concurrence, which means he agreed with the majority, 
but he wanted to have his own say in this. He wanted to actually say a few things. Uh, and he came out swinging really against, um, against the state of New York and also against some of his colleagues, including Chief Justice Roberts. He actually, for, for court watchers, this was a very unusual thing. He actually took on Chief Justice Roberts by name and was really very harshly critical and said, you know, uh, how come liquor stores and bicycle shops have no restrictions within orange zones? They are essential, but, but churches are, you know, restricted. They can't let people in. And he made some sarcastic comments about, you know, who knew public health, I'm quoting now, who knew public health would so perfectly align with, um, with secular convenience? And he said, we can't shelter, we, the justices, we cannot shelter in place while the Constitution is under attack. Okay, that was a little bit unusual for, for a justice to do that. There were also some dissents. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts dissented. He said that the court should not have stopped enforcement of these restrictions. Um, he sort of said that it was sort of moot. Moot means that, um, you know, Governor Cuomo had already changed the restrictions. They were no longer in effect. Maybe the court shouldn't have weighed in on this. He also, you know, responded to Justice Gorsuch and said, you know, we're not afraid and this is just, we have a difference of opinion here. Um, and there were, there were three dissents. Justices Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor dissented. Justice Sotomayor's dissent was a kind of, I don't want to say radical one, but, but she really, you know, some of the other justices just, I think, felt it wasn't time to do this. They wanted to, you know, wait and see how the lower court case developed. Um, Justice Sotomayor said, you know, no, there's nothing wrong with what New York has done. And she made an interesting point. Um, she said, really, when you compare churches to other institutions, and, you know, you ask, are churches being treated less fairly? She said, really, you have to compare churches not to grocery stores, not to garages, but you have to compare churches to other settings where large groups of people gather and speak and sing in close proximity. So that would be not grocery stores, not liquor stores, not acupuncture studios, but lectures and sporting events and concerts. And she said, if you look at those things, New York treats them just the same as churches. They are also subject to these restrictions. In fact, she said, New York actually treats religious gatherings more favorably than movie theaters or, um, or you know, concerts or things like this. So that was the way the court ruled um, five to four against the New York restrictions. The case now goes back to the lower courts. They'll work it out for a final decision. As I say, there are a number of other cases in the pipeline. They're being decided all the time. Um, the cases are very fact specific. Tonight, the Supreme Court said that Kentucky's restrictions on any in-person schooling, um, so Kentucky, the governor of Kentucky said no in-person schooling, not public schools, not private religious schools. That was constitutional, uh, the court said in another one of these emergency rulings. There are cases coming up from California and Nevada that are currently in the pipeline. They actually were here, uh, they were at the court in the summer, then they're coming back now. So there are, there's a lot of ferment out there. What I'd like to do is actually just talk not about each of these cases specifically because it's, it's sort of you get into the weeds, but I wanna talk about some broader points here because there has been a lot of heat generated, generated by these cases. And I wanna ask why, because they really are very narrow. These cases are very narrow. They're five, four decisions. They turn on specific facts. Um, why have they drawn so much attention? Why have they generated so much heat among the public? Okay, I think there are a few reasons. Uh, one is, the obvious one is, we're, we're dealing with a once in a century, let's hope, a once in a century epidemic that has killed almost 300,000 Americans so far. Hospitalizations are going up. There's, I think, another record number of hospitalizations last week. People are predicting another shortage of ICU beds across the country. So, you know, it's genuinely a crisis. That's one reason why people are paying so much attention to these cases. <laughs> Second, the cases I think are genuinely difficult. Uh, at least they seem so to me. I, I think that the dissenters and the majority, the judges, justices in the majority actually make some good points. I think it's not easy to decide whether um, the state has chosen the least restrictive means of achieving its interests here. And maybe we could argue about that. Um, uh, it's certainly important, I think, for judges who are not experts. You know, judges are judges like the justices. They're just 
pretty good lawyers, that's all. They're not public health experts, they're not scientists. There's a long tradition of the court deferring to public health experts, and that's certainly an important concern. On the other hand, um, with all due respect, our, our public leaders have not been consistent in this epidemic, maybe because that's, they didn't have the information, but they didn't say that. They made some very definitive statements in the beginning, which turned out then to be untrue or which they changed. You know, we're seeing every night, there seems another report of some major public official violating his or her own rules. I just saw one from Rhode Island yesterday. Governor of Rhode Island's out having a drink with her friends when she's telling people not to go and go to bars. So that doesn't really increase deference that judges are gonna to give to public health officials and government if that's what they're doing. Um, third, there is a new composition of the court. Everyone knows uh, Justice Ginsburg passed away this summer. She's been replaced by Justice Barrett and that has changed the outcome of these cases. Last summer when Justice Ginsburg was still on the court, there were some cases about these restrictions that were decided by votes of five to four, but in favor of the restrictions. Now we have a vote of five to four against the restrictions. And everybody knows the reason is that we have a new justice who's taken the place of Justice Ginsburg. And I think that has also gotten a lot of attention and, and frankly made some people angry. And that's another reason why people are paying attention to this. Um, religious accommodations are very much in the news right now, not just about COVID, but there have been a number of cases in which um, uh, employers have sought accommodations to get out of the so-called contraception mandate. Um, there's a case called Hobby Lobby. Some of you may know about this from 2014. There are some cases involving wedding vendors who do not want to provide services for same-sex weddings on religious grounds. So there are a number of cases out there and the COVID cases just play into those cases. Uh, that's another reason why I think people are paying attention. Finally, and I think maybe most importantly, for my own, uh, my own, in my own view is, unfortunately, I mean, in my opinion, deeply unfortunately, the COVID epidemic has become part of our culture war. Uh, it's become part of our political and cultural polarization, you know, debates about quote unquote, science and quote unquote religion, or, or you know, debates about equality and freedom. Um, unfortunately, this public health crisis has become another political thing that we argue about. And I think actually I'll, I'll close just by quoting Justice Kavanaugh in a case from Nevada this summer, a COVID case from Nevada, who said, quote, the definitional battles over what constitutes favoritism, discrimination, equality, or neutrality can influence, if not decide, the outcomes of religion cases. But the parties to religion cases and the judges deciding those cases often do not share a common vocabulary or common background principles. And that disconnect can muddy the analysis, build resentment, and lead to litigants and judges talking past one another. And I think, unfortunately, we might be seeing that, especially in in the, in the public's reaction to these cases, people kind of talking past each other and not really, because they don't even, they don't, they don't even start from the same place, unfortunately. So um, I'll, end it, I'll just say one last thing. These, these are gonna continue, you know, uh, Larry, I'm sure we'll have another session on this in, in a few months because these cases are not going away. Um, as long as COVID is with us, we're gonna keep having these cases. And um, as I say, there seems to be a new one every day. <laughs> 